Good evening, everyone. Well, you're very welcome tonight. Um, so I begin with a, uh, a, a sort of funny admission. So I just finished with the, the class, with the, uh, with the second presentation on the introduction to prayer. And I'm not kidding you. I just was like two minutes away. I was just wrapping up. And I said, oh, no. I, I said to everybody that was there, I was like, I didn't record. I didn't hit record. <laughs> So here we are. It's just me. There's no one here. Uh, and uh, so I'm just talking to you, hopefully someone who's watching. So uh, anyway, what we're going to do is I'm going to go through what we talked about in that presentation. And um, hopefully you find it helpful and a practical way for you to grow in your life of prayer. So we'll begin with a prayer together. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle within us the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. O God, who by the light of the Holy Spirit did instruct the hearts of thy faithful, grant by the same Holy Spirit we may be truly wise, and ever rejoice in his consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady, Queen of Ireland, Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So uh, we've been looking at the three ways of the spiritual life and the three ways are three different stages of the spiritual life, different stages that the soul kind of passes through in order to, um, in order to get kind of where we're going. Um, where are we going? The whole point of it is to grow in union with God. You'll know that you'll you'll recognize that we need to pass through these different stages, and these three different processes have to happen in order for us to grow in that union with God. So, the three stages are the purgative way is the first, right? The second stage is the illuminative way, and the third sta stage is the unitive way. And each of those three stages has a process that's kind of happening. Now, an actual fact. The three processes are happening in each of the stages, but one kind of is stands out as being most important. So in the purgative way, there's a purification that's happening, and that's what we're going to talk about today. The second stage is the illuminative way, and during that stage is like our transformation. So we grow more and more like Jesus, right? That's that sort of the primary thing that's happening in that stage. And then the third is the unitive way, this last stage, and that's where we're growing in union, uh, in a union of love with God, an habitual and intimate union with God. So um, this first stage of the spiritual life is the purgative way. And the first process that's happening is our purification. The goal is our union with God in love. But in order to approach the all holy God, um, God Almighty, we have to be purified first. Here's an image for you. Have you ever been asleep and kind of cheerfully sleeping away, sleeping during the morning, and the sun has already already risen, uh, but you're in a beautiful dark room? Have you ever had somebody come in and like rip open the curtains, right? And the light just comes pouring in, and it's just it's like, oh my gosh. Painful, right? If it happens to you. Funny if you do it to somebody else. The process of purification is a bit like that. Um, we're coming into the light of the truth. We're coming into the light of the truth. The truth, yes, about who God is, but also the truth about who we are. And that can be, that can be unpleasant. So we're coming into the light of the truth. That God, for instance, is our creator and our Lord that we depend on him completely and that we need salvation from the condition that we're in. We are a mess and we need a savior in the worst way. So the process of purification, where does it begin? It begins by us receiving the savior's mercy and forgiveness. His mercy, again, is inexhaustible. There's a beautiful image that St. Faustina is fond of using, uh, that God's mercy is like this uh, expansive ocean, 
or is like a uh, a burning like a like an incandescent furnace and that our sins are like a drop of water which gets totally like consumed in the ocean or totally burnt up in the furnace god's mercy is infinitely greater than anything it comes up against than any sins that we might have they're like nothing in comparison to god and his forgiveness where do we experience first god's forgiveness and his mercy well we experience it in a special way in baptism and in confession those are the places that we most experience god's mercy or that we experience it maybe in a privileged way our sins are completely and truly forgiven there that's where purification starts but even after we've experienced God's forgiveness, there is a purification of our human nature, a repairing of our human nature that has to happen, and that usually takes some time. Because we are stuck in certain patterns, we might have attachments or like habits of, let's say, mortal sin, first of all, that we have to break. Everybody knows about that, right? That's the first step of conversion, leaving behind serious sin and turning back towards God and now living according to his will, living as he asks us to live. But we also have to break our attachment to venial sins, right? This is something that people don't think about as much, a little bit less obvious. And I'm going to look at those two first, this breaking of the habits of sin, of mortal sin or venial sin and the attachments to sin. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into the prayer, the type of prayer that's most fitting for this process or this stage of purification of the purgative way. So first of all, mortal sin and venial sin, a bit of a refresher, all right? Mortal sin turns us completely away from our goal of loving God and being united with him. It's called mortal because it kills, it's fatal. It kills the supernatural life within the soul. Mortal sin does. When we mortally sin, we require God to bring us back to life, to regenerate that supernatural life that has died within our soul. And he regenerates that. He kind of brings it back into life, reanimates it uh, in the sacrament of confession. Knowingly and freely disobeying God's commandments in a grave way usually understood, this, uh, the catechism says, as one of the Ten Commandments, is how we, is, is what constitutes a mortal sin. So where you, the three conditions are, you know that it's wrong, you freely, you're, you're, uh, you act according to your free will, you freely choose this, and it's a grave matter. All three of those conditions have to be present in order for it to be mortal sin. An unrepentant mortal sin is as devastating as it gets. It separates the soul from God. And if we die in that state without having gone to confession, it can result in eternal separation from God and hell. Okay. So that's pretty straightforward, sobering, but it's pretty straightforward. <clears throat> but then you've got venial sins, right? Deliberate venial sins. Now, venial sins are not like mortal sins. They don't kill. They are not fatal, but they harm the supernatural life of God within your soul. It's a very common thing then for people to think, um, oh, all right, well, it's not a big deal then. You know, like it doesn't kill it. So it does, it's, it's mortal sins in, in our, the a superficial, simplistic way of us thinking about it is mortal sins are a big deal. Venial sins are not a big deal, right? Uh, and then we can kind of delude ourselves. We can kind of congratulate ourselves uh, if let's say you make some progress and you're not like living in mortal sin or habitually falling into mortal sin, we can sort of like pat ourselves on the back and we can look at other people and say like, huh, well, I'm doing better than that guy anyway. You know, um, that is really unhelpful. And we can kind of indulge then our, uh, our little unfaithfulnesses to God, the little ways in which we're unfaithful. That is really unhelpful. It's actually a big problem in the spiritual life uh, because it, it, well, I'll tell you why. And two, there are two main reasons why deliberate venial sin is a big deal. Number one is 
it is it it is we direct a terrible offense against God. And the second reason it's a big deal is because we hurt ourselves doing it. So first of all, this offense against God, just because it's a, not a mortal sin doesn't mean it's just not a sin. Like it is still disobeying God. Here's what deliberate venial sin is in plain English, right? It's where I knowingly take God and his mercy and his goodness to me and his glory. And I choose to put my own pleasure and my own whims above him. It's where I face a choice between me and him. And I choose me. When you think about it like that, it is like, oh, it is. The reality of it is much less. Um, I don't know. Um, it's much more distasteful. It's much uglier than we would normally think. And we fool ourselves into thinking that it is. St. Teresa of Avila doesn't mince any words. This is how she describes it. She says, it's as if we said, Lord, I know full well that this displeases you. Yet I shall do it nonetheless. I know perfectly well that you do not want it. But I will fall, would, but I will rather follow my own bent and fancy than your will. This is no small thing. This is a big thing. St. Teresa of Avila says that. I mean, she's a doctor of the church. She's one of the, the giants of the spiritual life. Deliberate venial sin, even though it's, even if it's not a, it's not a grave matter, right? It still shows serious ingratitude and a lack of love to God on our part and a preoccupation or a, um, a, an over-regard basically for ourselves and for what I want. And it doesn't matter what about anybody else because I want it, you know? The second reason that this is a big deal, deliberate venial sin, is because it hurts us. We're the ones who suffer because of this. Deliberate venial sin deprives us of lo deprives us of loads of graces that God wants to give us. It decreases our fervor. It makes us more lukewarm. Um, you know, when we're constantly not choosing to love God or choosing to indulge ourselves over and over and over and repeatedly over and over again, like our wills become weaker. We become less fervent and devoted to God. And we set ourselves up for a bigger temptation that's more devastating for a mortal sin. We're setting ourselves up for to fall. Okay. I want to add just a, a caveat here. Okay. So there's a difference between, in the spiritual life, between deliberate venial sin and what are called faults of surprise. A fault of surprise is where, like, thoughtlessly and um, momentarily some word just slips out of our mouth or we tell a, little, a lie, but we just, just out, you know, before we can even think about it. And, uh, or where we're like careless in prayer, you know, it's like, oh, I, I, it just happened. Um, it's not deliberate, in other words, right? There's a difference between something being deliberate and something being a fault of surprise. And we treat them differently. We respond to them differently. So a fault of surprise, you know, we, when we realize like, oh, what we've done or said or whatever, we turn to God and we might say, Lord, I'm so sorry. And we might ask him to forgive us. But then we're gentle with ourselves, actually. We're patient. We realize that this is just part, this is because I'm fallen. And we don't get, don't let it discourage us. Whereas with deliberate venial sin, it's a very different way that we handle it. We're strong with ourselves and we say, like, I'm not going to be doing this anymore. Okay. So here's an example, practical to sort of, I think, uh, maybe illustrate the point. So tonight we had a lazy night in the presbytery. Um, we didn't want to cook. So we ordered pizza, right? Great. So it's a Wednesday and I'm doing this thing called Exodus 90. And part of Exodus 90 means that you're not supposed to eat meat on Wednesday. Great. I ordered the pizza, right? And so I knew this. And so I 
like a hero, a hero. I ordered for myself a veggie pizza. I mean, a far inferior pizza. And I ordered the rest of these guys who are not doing Exodus 90, beautiful meat pizzas, right? And also um, we got some like appetite, like little meat, these appetizer things that they like and that I like too, but anyway, I can't have them. <coughs> so fine. So we sit down and we're eating pizza together, hanging out. And uh, before I know it, I'm eating. Before I know it, I look over at my buddy and I'm across the table. I'm like, it's Wednesday. I'm not supposed to eat meat. I had taken two of those little appetizers. and I just had popped them into my mouth, like thoughtlessly. I just, I wasn't like, I just thoughtlessly just like, they're in my mouth. And I was like, ah, oh, flip. That is a fault of surprise. It was no, it wasn't deliberate. I didn't intentionally do that. If on the other hand, I sat down and there was the pizzas in front of me and I looked around and I thought, I know I'm not supposed to, but it's been a hard day. And, you know, what, like, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, I can make up, make up for it in other ways. Start making excuses. And I deliberately take the meat. That's not a grave matter. It's not breaking one of the Ten Commandments. But that is a deliberate venial sin. See the difference between the two? Okay. Here's the long and short of it, right? We don't want any attachment to sin to compromise our love for God. We want no nothing to compromise our love for God. An important virtue that someone in the stage is going to want to try to stir up within them is a generosity with God. Not settling for any half-hearted effort. We do not want to be lukewarm. We want to refuse God nothing. And we want to put nothing else ahead of him or as a rival to him or something that kind of draws us away from him. We want to cut that stuff. That's part of that purification it's called, it's detachment, right? Now we come to prayer, right? So what is the kind of prayer that's most conducive to this process of purification or that's most like associated with the stage of the purgative way? Okay. There are two types of prayer that are associated with this stage, right? Um, the first is vocal prayer, right? And the second are spirit certain spiritual exercises that are the beginnings of what are called mental prayer okay so first of all vocal prayer what is vocal prayer vocal prayer is exactly what it says in the tin it is prayer that is expressed out loud or in gestures right simple as that now they can be either learned by rote like kind of prayers that you've memorized or they can be spontaneous prayers that you pray out loud the catechism says this about more about vocal prayer. The catechism says that vocal prayer is an essential part of the Christian life. It's the foundation on which all other the, all the other forms of prayer are built. It's not something that you sort of like do and then you kind of get past that you grow you're too you're too big, you're too holy, too mature for vocal prayer. No, you don't get past this. It is always a part of your life, always. So the saints prayed out loud, right? Since the development of the rosary, hard to imagine a saint that wasn't devoted to the rosary, right? Um, I heard a great story uh, recently about St. John Paul II, a priest friend of mine. Some of you probably know that St. John Paul II would invite people into his private oratory for daily mass. And they would come in and they would pray with him and before mass. And then he, he would get up and celebrate mass and they were, they would be able to be there with him. So a friend of mine was a priest in Rome and uh, was able to go to one of the masses. And there were probably like 20 people in that little chapel and uh, he would celebrate mass. As it was like, the last thing impressions, he said, the thing that most struck him and he was most impressed by was John Paul II kneeling in prayer and the 
the weight that seemed to be on him. The prayer was so intense. He would say, he would be kneeling there and he would be praying out loud and he would be saying things like, Jesus, oh Lord, I love you, Lord. And he would be like groaning, praying aloud. This is one of the giants. This is, I mean, an absolute giant in the spiritual life. John Paul II. Vocal prayer is part and parcel forever. Why is important to pray aloud? Why is it a good thing? Well, first, because we're not angels. We're human beings. We are body and spirit. We're, all, we're flesh and blood. Um, we need to experience the, we, we experience rather the need to express aloud or in our bodies the, um, what's happening internally. Another reason why it's good to pray out loud is that praying aloud adds power or like sort of like an intensity to your supplication. When you pray aloud, it's like John Paul the Saint, John Paul the Second. You know, when you pray aloud, it's like your whole, it's kind of, you're putting your back into it, right? Um, another reason why it's good to pray out loud is because uh, it's, because it's so external and it's so human, it is the most conducive to connecting us with other people in prayer. So for instance, like families, right? How hard is it, those of you who are like raising families and maybe you pray the rosary together uh, daily or occasionally, right? How hard is it to sit down and get everybody to pray the rosary together? A bunch of kids, right? Imagine getting everybody to sit down and doing like 20 minutes of silent meditation. <laughs> like, forget about it, you know? Vocal prayer is helpful to bring people together within prayer. Or married couples pray aloud maybe together certain prayers. Or men's groups or women's groups, whatever, you know? You can manage it in some ways like mental prayer, you know, kind of internal prayer. But like you could see how vocal prayer is most conducive to bringing people together and uniting them in prayer. What about those rote prayers, those prayers that we learn when we were kids, right? Um, kind of down on memorization sometimes. We don't like the idea of sitting down and like making ourselves memorize stuff. Um, those are super important. Those are really important. Um, why? Because first of all, they communicate the faith. Uh, some of my heroes, my, my great heroes really are Jesuit missionaries. I love, since the 16th century, they've gone everywhere and they have brought Christ to so many people and they brought so many people into the kingdom of God. It's been, it's just incredible. They're just one of the most incredible, like, um, missionary movements that has ever emerged within the church. Maybe the most incredible. When they went out, do you know what they did? They taught people prayers. <laughs> they would teach like the, the people that they went to serve, the creed, the Our Father, the Hail Mary. And then they would use those prayers in order to communicate the faith. They would teach them about the faith, having taught them these prayers, these set prayers, right? Another one of the, um, one of the uh, parts of this process of purification we know is this internalizing truths of faith, you know, who am I really, you know, what am, what, what kind of state am I in truly? How much do I need God? Um, if that's the case, these rote prayers drive deep into us, these truths of faith. One of the beautiful things as a priest is you get to be people as they come close to dying, right? And as they come close to dying, uh, you can, uh, you, as you pray with them, often you will find that people will, even people who are not terribly with it or even people with dementia or things like that, you'll find that those people start to pray along with you. The Our Father or the Hail Mary, they just sort of, it's so deeply ingrained within them that they just begin to pray as well, even though so much of, of everything else is gone, right? Deep within us, those truths are being written when we learn how to pray like that and we pray over and over again. The Our Father, we need God for our daily bread to forgive us, 
to help us in temptation and to deliver us from evil. Those are truths that are like just constantly being reaffirmed within us. Or the Hail Mary. We are sinners who can be confident in the intercession of our mother now and at the hour of our death. These are things, again, that are just like so good that we're internalizing and we're taking again and again. It's like they're being kind of written within our heart, right? Now, I'm not going to go through all the rote prayers. You know them yourself or you can get a hold of them anyway. But I just I do want to encourage you to have them down yourself and also to teach them to your children. Very, very important, right? They're the building blocks. I'm going to give you some additional vocal prayers that are um, less obvious, but also really helpful. So the first is morning and evening prayers. So to begin the day with God and to kind of give him the day, ask for his help, to acknowledge that you need God. And at the end of the day, to thank God, to ask his forgiveness and to consecrate the night to him, you know? Um, now, at this point, it's really helpful. I have in this in the um, in this email that I'm sending you, I've also attached this uh, prayer handout, okay? So basically what I've done in this prayer handout is I've written a whole bunch, or I didn't written it, but I've compiled a whole bunch of traditional prayers, like morning prayers, morning offerings, and night prayers, and uh, other sorts of things as well, like a prayer of spiritual communion if you can't go to daily mass, or aspirations, which are these like little prayers that you pray throughout the day, kind of like John, what John, St. John Paul II was doing there, like Jesus, like uh, blessed be God, uh, my God and my all, my Jesus mercy. Like these are little prayers that you can pray kind of throughout the day, turning your attention back to God. I've written them out for you here, some of them. Uh, and then the Angelus, right? Which again, three times throughout the day, we turn to pray the Angelus. Okay, so um, this is something that's here for you. Uh, which I encourage you to look at it like a resource. This is not like a to-do list, right? You're not going to be able to do everything here, all right? So don't don't worry about it, okay? But it's a resource that it, you can draw from. You can take some of these things, hopefully, and find them helpful, all right? Other types of vocal prayers that are that are helpful, that are good within this this stage, particularly, are prayers like the Rosary, right? The the Angelus, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, those aspirations that I mentioned there. And novenas, right? Irish people love novenas typically. I learned, I don't know if I knew anything about novenas before I came here, but uh, you guys love your novenas. Okay. So those are the vocal prayers. Now, there are also spiritual exercises, okay? The, these are um, different types of prayer and really they're the beginnings of meditation, okay? Um, the The maybe the way to the umbrella term for all of these is called mental prayer, mental prayer. Okay. And um, you'll see that there's a connection between these and vocal prayer in just a minute, but um, they're all called mental prayer. Mental prayer basically is, again, it's like what it says on the tin. It's prayer that takes place within the soul. It's not prayed out loud. It's internal, right? So there's two types of mental prayer that are really helpful that I want to give you here um, that you might use. And uh, I'll explain them to you. So the first is a nightly examine. Okay. And the second one is called discursive prayer. So the nightly examine, first of all, the nightly examine is an excellent prayer from St. Ignatius of Loyola. He's one of my favorite saints. Um, and it's basically a, a prayer of reflecting at the end of the day. You reflect back on your on your day. And it's really practical. It's in five points, which I really love. I love like, okay, what's stage one? What's step one? Okay, now what's step two? Now, I just like the practicality of it. You know, I think it's very helpful. So um, he, you go through these stages and the first stage is to look back over your day and to recognize God's blessings throughout the day. And you literally start at the beginning of the day and just kind of go chunk your way through hour by hour or sort of like, period of time by period of time. And you're just looking at how God has blessed you throughout the day. Then you go and you asking for God's help and light. You go back and you look at any of the, at, at, over the course of your day to look to see where 
you have sinned, where you have been unfaithful in thought, word, or deed, right? And uh, you do this in order to come before God and to ask his forgiveness and also to learn. You want to learn from your mistakes, not just kind of repeat them over and over and over again. And you realize at the end of the day, like, you know, as, as you keep going, like, oh, gosh, I, this is an area that I need to grow in, actually. I keep, this is something I continually struggle with. Okay. That's progress. That's good. And you can see how this ties into purification, right? So you're learning how to trust in God more, who God is. He is my father whom I can trust. And you're also facing squarely your attachments and habits of sin, asking God forgiveness, and then working on those, <laughs> you know, so you're being purified. So you can see how the examine really ties into this um, process of purification, which is this, again, happens in the stage, particularly in the stage of the purgative way, the, the, the yeah, the stage of, of spiritual life called the purgative way. The second type of prayer is called the uh, discursive prayer. By the way, with the examine, it's also in here, right? So you can go through the five point little thing on your little cheat sheet, your resource, prayer resource here. Discursive prayer is the second type of mental prayer that I want to tell you about. So this is in fact the beginning of meditation, right? Um, which we're going to look at more next week. Um, discursive prayer is basically where you are using your mind you're using your your intellect and what you're doing is you're reading the truths of faith and you're reflecting on them so that you can grow in your conviction of them that's the first thing that's kind of happening there you're reading these truths of the faith and you're reflecting on them so that you can grow stronger in your conviction about them then you let them challenge you and kind of like you reflect a little bit. Okay. How am I, am I living the life actually? And you make a good revolution and you pray for God's help to live by that more faithfully. So I'll give you an example. Maybe this is going to be helpful. So let's say the truth of faith that you're kind of looking at that you're reading about is um, God's being your father, your good father who provides for you everything that you need. You read that. And it's not just, you don't, want, you don't want just to leave it up here. You want to like internalize this and reflect on it. So you can be stronger in your conviction that that's true. And you let that challenge you. And you say like, do I live that? Do I live as though God was my father who provides for everything that I need? Well, actually, you know what? Very often I, I'm very anxious and I'm full of fear. And fear can be like a real dominant thing in my life. Okay, good. Now in resolution, you say like, all right, well, when I find myself really getting anxious and stuck in this like cycle of fear, I'm going to remember, I'm going to try to remember that God is my father and that he's always provided for me and he gives me what I need. And I'm going to choose to have faith over fear. That's discursive prayer kind of working, right? You guys see that those, those sorts of things, how that's happening. And you can see how, again, this works, this ties in so well with this purification. If purification is growing in the light of the truth, you're focusing on these truths, kind of internalizing them, growing stronger in them, letting them challenge you, and now making a resolution to live more in the light of this truth, to live more in the light. Now, you might find yourself asking, like, okay, well, where do you even read these things, you know? Um, well, it used to be where you had like loads of these books of meditations. They were just like standard issue, like kind of Catholic spirituality 101. Lay people regularly had these little devotionals and they would read through these things and they would use discursive prayer. Discursive prayer was one of those kind of standard ways that people prayed. Well, that those are gone. Unfortunately, they they're, they're not, they don't print them. They've fallen out of print and there's not many new ones being written. And okay. But that said, I do have a few of them here for you, all right? So um, the first is from St. Jose Maria Escriva. St. Jose Maria Escriva was the, the founder of Opus Dei. God showed to St. Jose Maria his vision for Opus Dei, this kind of um, this spiritual movement within the, within the church where 
um, where the central message was that it was by being faithful to their vocation where God had called them that lay people would be sanctified and that they would grow in imitation of Christ, grow to become more like him and that they would, um, they would grow in holiness. So whether you were a mother or a doctor, whether you were a, you know, a teacher or, um, you know, like a sanitation worker, like it was whatever it was, that's where God had you. And it was by being faithful to that task, to that vocation, to that, to that job, uh, that God was going to, um, work on you basically. Anyway, that's the vision of Opus Dei. But St. Jose Maria wrote a number of books of meditations, helpful little, little things that you would do well to kind of take, reflect on, grow in conviction, let you let them challenge you and, and make resolutions. So St. Jose Maria's short books, they're short little books. First is called The Way. The second is called The Forge. The third is called Furrow. And then there's another one called the way of the cross, the way of the cross. And the second resource that I have thought of for you uh, is a spiritual classic. It's called the imitation of Christ, the imitation of Christ. Now loads of, there's loads of translations of it. Some are very old fashioned and archaic. Maybe that's right up your alley. Others are very much more contemporary and sort of like, you know, uh, of this time, and maybe that's more up your alley. Look for a translation that suits you, right? But there's different, loads of different translations. And, um, but it's very, it is like, it is a, a classic. It is an absolute classic. It is this, I read, it's the second most printed book ever after the Bible, The Imitation of Christ. And most people haven't heard of it, much less read it. So The Imitation of Christ, a great book for discursive meditation. Okay, so those are the types of prayer. Um, I have some tips for you, right, before we kind of uh, wrap it up. First, don't try all of these things at once. You're not going to be able to do that. You're not going to be able to do all of these things full stop, right? No one is. Um, if you try, it's just going to be overwhelming, and uh, you're going to get discouraged, right? So... This thing that I've given you, right, is not, I repeat, a to-do list. What this is, is a resource for you. Begin. Maybe you're starting from scratch, right? I'll give you a couple of things maybe that I think are, like, in your list of priorities, maybe the place to start, right? But, like, start somewhere. Or if you're already doing some of these things, great. Maybe take another thing and sort of, like, see if you can advance the ball a little bit. You know what I mean? But don't think that you're going to be able to do all of these these two page, pages of prayers and um, spiritual exercises because it's just you know it's it, it's nobody is doing that right and it's a great way to get discouraged. So where would you start then? Okay, if you're starting from scratch, this is me thinking that the morning and evening prayers would be a really good thing, right? first thing that you do in the morning and the last thing you do at night, you know, to turn towards God and give him your day and pray and acknowledge your need for him. And at the end of the day to, to thank him, ask his forgiveness, you know, to entrust to him, your family and the, the night it's good. You know, it's a really good kind of like the two um, hinges of the day. Then the examine. I think the examine is another great thing. And I think just because it's such a great way to see the hand of God at work throughout your day, it's also really great to grow in, in gratitude and in trust. And it's also a really great way to square up and face your sins, learn about yourself, learn more about yourself, what you need to work on and to be to become more humble, ask God's forgiveness. Um, third, the rosary, the divine mercy chaplet and Start with a decade. That's fine. You know, you don't do you just, it's, this is a, you know, it's like sports, you know, it's like training for a massive race. Uh, you don't go out. If your goal is to run a marathon, you don't go out the first day and try to run a marathon. You're going to die, right? You go out there and you begin somewhere. 
you begin with, you know, a five minute walk or a five minute run or like a walk run or something like that. You know, you begin small and that's okay. That's where you're starting. And then you move from there. Right. Um, the last thing or the, another thing is, excuse me, I'm still going on this list. So again, morning and evening prayer, examine rosary or divine mercy chaplet. Fourth is discursive prayer, this kind of meditation, the beginning of meditation that I was describing to you. And then the third would, or the, the last, excuse me, the fifth would be um, novenas, the Angelus aspirations, um, some of which are on here, right? On this prayer resource. Another tip, prepare well, all right? Um, if you are coming home and you are stressed out from work, you've just had a sit in traffic, not going to be the best time to just go right away and sit and pray. You're going to want to calm down a little bit. You're going to want to and then go in, right? Or if you're listening to your earbuds, right? Hard for you to pop the earbuds out and then go in and pray because you're just operating on this level. You want to calm down, get a little bit of silence, and then go in. So pick your time and pick your place. Someplace quiet and a time that suits you. Some people are morning people. Some people are night people. If you, as soon as you, your head hits the pillow at night, if you were asleep, probably not the best place for you to pray in bed, right? Or if you are like constantly late getting up in the morning and you're struggling with that, uh, probably not the best time to schedule your few minutes of prayer, right? Okay. So pick a time and pick a place that works for you. The last thing that I want to say is don't get discouraged, right? If you're waiting to see if you're going to fail, uh, spoiler alert, you are, okay? Um, you're not going to do this perfectly. There's going to be days when you're going to forget. There's going to be days when you are lazy and weak, right? Don't throw in the towel then and say, oh, sure, what's the point? What's well, the point? That is the temptation, right? Do not do that. Don't do that. Okay, you forgot. Okay, you were lazy and you didn't do it. All right, ask God's forgiveness. Now begin again. Start again. Next day. Okay. Um, yeah, don't let discouragement stop you from continuing on, you know? It's important that you pick yourself back up and you get back in there again. Okay. Uh, I'll finish just the quote from GK Chesterton. Um, he's a great, uh, Catholic author kind of, you know, uh, thinker and wit. He said, anything worth doing is worth doing badly. So <laughs> we're all, we're all in the same boat. We all, have lots to learn in prayer and we're all a work in progress and a bit of a mess. Um, but you've got some resources now. You've got some sort of sense of like, okay, at the beginning stage is what's really happening and what kind of prayer would be most helpful. Um, that's, that's hopefully you're in a better position now than you were an hour ago. Um, next week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the next stage of the spiritual life, which is called the illuminative way. And we're going to look at the, um, the process that's happening during that, which is our transformation. In other words, our becoming more like Jesus. And then we're going to look at the prayer that's associated with that, which is uh, meditation, kind of like the, a more developed form of meditation than discursive prayer that we discussed here today. So we'll finish now with a prayer. Okay. And then I will give you all a blessing. All right. And ask God's blessing on your families as well. So we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So let's pray and honor and ask the help of our Blessed Mother. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Knock, pray for us. Now the Lord be with you and with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.